screen. Very good. Okay, I, I, I think I'm gonna start with the, um, the background to this panel as we sort of leave some time for, for other people to join and come back from lunch. Um, because uh, be warned, this is a panel with a background. So um, th th there's a bit of a story behind this. Uh, so um, maybe to introduce that, I'm, I'm just gonna say a couple of words first about myself, sort of where I come from. Um, so, I currently chair the Media Development Foundation. It's an organization based out of Kyiv, Ukraine, and we do media development work across um, Central Eastern Europe and, and sort of the, the, the wider region, although a lot of it is based in Ukraine. Um, before that, I used to work as a journalist, and for a certain period of time, I also managed the Kyiv Post, which is um, the main English language newspaper in, in Ukraine. And uh, so, so the story um, here a little bit, in, 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 if I may say a few words about the, the Media Development Foundation, sort of the narrative starts in a very simple place. Um, the year was 2013, for those who don't know what the situation was then in Ukraine. Uh, there was a, a, a quite a dramatic uh, revolution out of Maidan. And before that, the situation of the media in the country was very bad. Um, and uh, so my favorite example from the time was uh, that of Forbes Ukraine, which was a great publication, did lots of investigative business work. And one day they wrote about this uh, young up and coming oligarch, uh, 27 years old, nobody knew his name, Serhii Kurchenko. And uh, when they investigated him, it turns out that he was worth more than a billion dollars, right? Um, so at, you know, what, what, what have you achieved at 27? Um, and, <laughs> Uh, and uh, after that article came out, uh, Mr. Kurchenko decided to buy United Media Holding, the, um, the, the company that owned uh, Forbes Ukraine. And let me just say that the journalists who worked there were not promoted, right? Um, so, so that was a very uh, big blow to, to the press situation there. And um, we decided that given that this kind of event could happen over and over again, we need to build a lifeboat for media and we decided to set up the Media Development Foundation. Um, after 2014 uh, and the revolution ended, there was a change in power, the situation with press freedom became better. But I'm not sure it became good. So in a way, life became easier, there were no big ogres, trolls running around the country ready to hit journalists with a stick. But that doesn't mean that everything is perfect, right? And so the idea is that, you know, in 2013, life is simple. You have a clear threat. If we look forward, I think what has happened is the threats to media uh, have become more sophisticated and more nuanced, right? And so we, we, one of the things we decided to do at the time was, well, let's, let's recreate uh, Media Development Foundation as an organization that can um, actually address those threats that are different, that, that, that sort of have a different nature. And I think the easiest way to summarize it is media are great in doing content, but there's a million other things that need to be successful um, for it to have impact. And so basically we said, okay, you guys do the great content and we're gonna help with everything else, whether it's operations, you know, business, um, uh, communications and so forth, and we launched a bunch of programs as a result of that that help, you know, whether it's for media management and uh, or or sort of like building up the organizations. And lastly, and and and, and here is where we get to the uh, the topic of discussion of today. We started a discussion with um, several media based around Europe of. Well, what are the things that are actually holding us back from achieving impact, right? I mean, you have the sort of 
uh, brutal, unsophisticated oppression of media, that's kind of one thing, right? But what is it that sort of holds us back when you have a great piece of content, you have a great investigation that's produced, and nothing happens? And I think that is something that everyone um, in this room is familiar with, a great story that fails to lead to change. And so we started to talk about this and what are the actual drivers? What, what is actually leading us to fail to achieve this, this impact? And one of the big things that came up was, well, unfortunately, people don't really trust media, right? Um, and, and so uh, there's been a lot of discussions about this and um, a lot of solutions have been proposed. Um, I'm really happy to have uh, three great panelists today who have all sort of tested different approaches with their media organizations. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. But, but I think just before we, we jump to that, I think what happened was, um, you know, we started, we, we first need to start out with the question of why do we actually have this rift, right? Um, because if there's a danger that we face as journalists, it's uh, having strong opinions straight away color our answers. Um, so, uh, of course, if anyone has ever been an editor, you know what that is. You sort of see what the answer looks like and you try to tell your readers that this is the content that you would like to consume. I think that kind of thinking tends to permeate all of our other activities. We know what is best. Um, so, w we actually know what the answer is. So, for this panel, we decided to take a step back. What is, what is actually the reason that media have lost the trust of uh, people? And um, we basically came up with this, this framework. And so, we know that, that the trust in media is low. It's comparable or slightly above political institutions in most countries although there are quite significant exceptions. We know that the drivers are complex, right? Uh, there are political attacks, there are attacks from criminal organizations, uh, people do black PR against media, but there are other stories as well. You know, the fact that people are overloaded, uh, desensitized um, because of the way we consume social media is definitely pa part of the story. What we have done wrong as media is also certainly part of the story. And we know that without trust, we cannot actually, you know, achieve the consequences that we want to achieve. So, opening up the discussion, I'd like to, um, I, I'd like to ask three questions. You know, one is how did we get there? Two, what works and what doesn't work? And what is the path forward? What is a solution that is realistic, can be replicated, and can be scaled? Um, before, uh, just, just two pages with a few statistics, because you do need them in any presentation. Um, so, so just to prove that the situation is quite complex. You know, why, do, why have people started to consume less news? You know, why are we losing out to, to, to the Netflixes, to coloring books, to all of the other things that gra grab people's attention? Well, there's a couple. People say that it's too depressing. There's too much agenda, there's too much bias, and we don't know what the real story is. Um, news is over-analyzed and over-sensationalized. And overall, there is a perception that quality has gotten worse, although that, that is one of the lower things. What we also know is that this has a strong relationship to the well-being of our countries. So it's a little bit far away, but basically on the, on the left-hand side you have trust to media, and on the right-hand side you have trust the governments. And if we look at some of the countries that are currently facing various political challenges, we also fa see that they face the challenge of trust in media. Um, to give you a few examples, uh, the, the, the United States, Poland, Hungary, represented here today, Ukraine as well, although it doesn't uh, figure, are all in the bottom left quadrant. Um, I think Britain is, is over, over optimistic, but these are numbers from 2017. Um, uh, uh, my, my hunch is that that is probably at the very bottom right now. Um, so, a complex question, but some great insights from the panelists. And I will move over now. And um, maybe if we can start with uh, you, Anna. So the question 
that I would ask, can you sort of introduce your organization and, and, and say a few words about why you think that the trust in media is so low? What is driving it? Thank you, Jakub, for introduction and for making these questions. Um, I'm introduced here as List24. It's Ukrainian investigative agency. Uh, we are publishing uh, online. We have a website. Uh, we are publishing print stories, online stories, and we are producing uh, uh, documentary investigative stories, like um, big documentaries about crimes, about murders, about big corruption. Um, in the past, we had weekly TV program, investigative TV program, but we decided to uh, change um, format for long investigative stories, documentaries, because it's for us it's possibility to uh, to introduce problem deeper than short stories for weekly TV program. Uh, so, as investigators, as journalists who work with this corruption stuff with uh, big and loud uh, murders, crimes. We know what is it, how important to, uh, to have uh, a trust. We, we know how it is important and we know uh, how many attacks, how many people we have who against our work, who try to destroy our reputation. Um, uh, thank you, Jakob, that you introduced situation in Ukraine, so I will not uh, waste time for this. Um, I mean, uh, five years ago, uh, before revolution, uh, we had situation where um, authorities, when president, prime minister, just ignored our investigations. So we just lived like in parallel worlds, and they just ignored all our findings or our investigations, so they just pretending that we are not exist. Uh, so we didn't have fight, we just lived with our small audience, they lived with their bigger audience. After things changed five years ago, uh, and a new authority, as Jakub mentioned, uh, situation with uh, freedom of speech, uh, media freedom in Ukraine is much better now. But uh, for these five years, we as journalists got new experience uh, uh, to fight with politicians on Facebook, online harassment, online fighting. So uh, it was new for us. First time, a uh, big scandal was when we published uh, Panama Papers. Uh, because I think that many of you know that um, we found our current president, Petro Poroshenko, in Panama Papers. Uh, he is owner of uh, he created offshore company when he already was in presidential, in presidential position. And uh, for sure, anyone knew about that before we published that. And it was a very big fight on social networks, on Facebooks, by his fans, Poroshenko's fans, and uh, uh, by president's team. And for two months, they tried to find at least small mistake in our story. Uh, some typos or everything just for um, for making all our work wrong and it was really it was fight for two months and uh, it was really hard and uh, they by this campaign on Facebook they I think that uh, president uh, people uh, changed opinion of some people of journalists about us about journalists that we didn't work good all the stuff so it was first time it was three years ago, first time then, then when we realized how um, that our task not only publish story, our task to force, to support our story after publishing, because after that we realized that it will be attack against us. They will try to find something personal, they will try to find something, uh, some typos, some mistakes, everything, just for making reputation of our agency bad. So now, when we publish something, we are, we are preparing. We, sometimes we even have brainstorms in our, um, in our agency for uh, trying to predict what attack will be, what weak uh, stuff we have in our investigations. Um, so I understand that the problem with trust in Ukraine is more important now. Uh, on one hand, it's good that um, authority is not ignoring us anymore. 
it's good, we have fight, yeah. But on the other hand, um, it's very easy in era of uh, social networks, it's very easy to destroy reputation by small things. And we should be ready every day, every minute for fighting, for um, for uh, for fighting with people who try to destroy it by small things. And for us, really, for our agency, for Ukraine, uh, we are trying to. We have fact checking uh, uh, people who make fact check of, of every story, every number, every name, everything we mention should be confirmed by documents because we don't want because of one small mistake to uh, to give uh, people who are against us to give them possibility to destroy all our story because usually we work for months for our stories and one of i think that we will i will talk about it a little bit later one of our own way for making trust with audience with people is offline events we make a lot of festivals, we make uh, releases of our documentaries around Ukraine. We meet with people, we discuss with them. If we have, like, just last week we released a um, big investigation about murder in Ukraine, murder of civil activists, it's a very big story. And we uh, released it in Kiev, in three more cities, and we will release it in, in other cities. Uh, for us, it's very important to meet with people, even if it will be only 20 people who come to talk with us, they will know that we are real people, we are just real journalists who, who, who just want to um, find truth. So that we just, um, we are not for money, we are just for fighting truth. We are investigators, we are journalists, and we meet with people, sometimes we argue, sometimes we are going for beer after this, uh, after this meetings, but for us it's very important, and I think it's for audience very important. If it will be not a lot of people, anyway, in the end, we will know that we know our audience, we talk to people, and I think, I hope that it works. Um, thank you so much for sharing that, uh, Anna. I, and I would love to to come back to a couple of these points because I think, you know, one thing that you mentioned is there, there are these huge social media risks which require a lot of defensive work on behalf of media organizations. But one way to get around that is by bu building these sort of personal connections and showing the media, the journalists, as, as sort of, you know, full, full people. But in, in, let's get back to that in a moment. Um, first, I'd like to move to, to Tamas. So, Tamas, you, you work in a, in a country which is, uh, at this point, uh, I think, a little bit notoriously famous for the difficult media environment. Uh, and you are fighting the good fight uh, amongst a, an increasingly small group. How, how is the perception of the audience of media in general and uh, your organization? So thank you for having me on this panel. I'm Tomás Bodoki, and uh, I represent Atlatso, which is an investigative center, a non-profit center in Budapest. Uh, we founded Atlatso in 2011, and we had no idea then what, we, what this will, this fight over media domination in Hungary will, will lead to this uh, current uh, situation. So. Atlatso is mostly about uh, public spending. We file a lot of freedom of information requests. We try to, to, to dig, uh, dig into facts because Hungarian journalism is very opinionated and very opinion-based, and we try to, to dig up uh, solid facts about how, how the government is spending the taxpayers' money and, and other uh, controversial issues. So. Uh, with, the, with, with uh, uh, the audience, what happened uh, since the last eight years was that uh, the, po the political debate in the media and, and the, the whole media landscape became uh, highly polarized because uh, Fidesz realized that they, they want to conquer, so the governing party realized that they need to conquer media, they, they want to conquer media and they want to create a media environment which uh, which where, where most of the media outlets are, are in favor of the government. And, and slowly but steadily they, they buy outlets, they, they establish new outlets, and they spend a huge amount of uh, taxpayers' money on, 
on so-called governmental co uh, information campaigns to fund these uh, new outlets and 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 this 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 are really astronomical numbers. So, like in 2017, only the, uh, one uh, campaign, the Stop Soros campaign, costs 41 million euros, and they are running multiple. Uh, campaigns uh, a year, and all, all these campaigns, of course, carry the political message of the, the government. But at the same time, they use these campaigns to fund the uh, loyalist media. And, and uh, what happened was that the uh, uh, audience got very polarized. Either people, some people get very angry about the government conquering the media and, and silencing the critical voices and others who support media, they believe all the, the lies and half-truths which are spread by the pro-government uh, media. So in our case, we need to, we, uh, we, we started out that we want to be non-partisan, we are non-partisan and we are not taking sides, but the government keeps calling us an opposition organization, political organization, so so they try to push us into a corner where the opposition parties are, and so the government handles independent press like like an oppo like a, a political entity, like uh, an opposition political entity, and we get a lot of uh, smear campaigns and so on, uh, which creates two effects. One effect is you get a lot of ha hate mail and comments on your website that uh, you bastards and so on. But the other side of the story is that a lot of people who don't like what the government does with the media start to support independent media more actively. So when first in 2014 the government attacked the, uh, the critical NGOs and the media we started to advertise that if you want to keep keep us going, then please not uh, not only like or share us on Facebook, but also you should donate. And this was a very successful message. So people started to donate uh, significantly more after, and and we we re rely on a very large uh, uh, percent of our budget relies on crowdfunding. So people started to, to donate more, and this was so successful that now uh, uh, practically all the remaining independent media in Hungary started the uh, crowdfunding campaigns, even the for-profit ones. So 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 market-based uh, market-based uh, media outlets also started uh, crowdfunding campaigns and and. Uh, uh, and saying that the government, uh, that they need, did need this money to withstand the government pressure, uh, what, what shows that this kind of communication was, uh, was, uh, was successful. Mm -hmm. okay. um, thank you very much for sharing that. So, so I think, you know, what, what I see is that in a country where, you know, an overwhelming uh, majority of media outlets have been captured, you have a, a, a small group of sort of resistors who have managed to use the pressure in a sort of almost a jujitsu move of, okay, well, if you attack us, well, that means that we're actually worth supporting. And w what you have managed to do is, is build on to that essentially a, a support model. Um, so for a little bit of context, I actually had a discussion with your, um, your, your CFO, Christina, a, a couple of weeks ago, and I was very impressed that uh, you, you have over 60% uh, of funding coming from uh, supporters, half of them recurring. So um, for those who follow sort of media monetization models, those, those numbers are very impressive, especially for an investigative outlet, which is not sort of, you know, do, do, doing the sort of day-to-day -day work, but more focusing on, on big investigations. Um, so l let's come back to that in, in a moment. Um, I, I'd like to take that idea of, you know, the, the, the idea of actually reaching out to people um, um, and, and, you know, and building this relationship, which is also financial, right? There is also that element, which is very important. Um, and uh, Jakub, first, if maybe you can tell us a little bit about Outriders, because I think you've sort of approached the problem in a very novel way. Um, building a network, building a publication that is sort of membership driven. 
how have you sort of approached this challenge of, of uh, building relationships at a time when trust is, is, is a difficult issue? Okay, so uh, first of all, I'm the second Jakub on this panel, so you can call me Kuba for the next 30 minutes to avoid confusion because uh, I'm getting confused. Uh, Very myself. good name, by the way. <laughs> it's a good job. Yeah. So, so hi, my name is Jakub. Um, no, my name is Kuba, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and yes, Outriders, um, well, we, well, we started in September 2017, and we are an online publication. Uh, which covers global issues which have local impact. So uh, when it comes to topics, we focus, well, at least we try to focus mostly on topics related to migration, environment, or, or technology. And uh, we also release, besides doing lots of interactive stories, we also release uh, a weekly magazine uh, as a newsletter, which is read by over 15,000 people um, currently. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, we had a couple of problems which we tried to solve before Outright.rs was born. And I actually have to say that you were a great inspiration. We met uh, four months before Outriders was officially launched. And when I saw that, you know, and don't take it the wrong way, when people in Hungary can do it, then we also can do it. Because we are tend to look at uh, US startups or uh, Western Europe startups. But in our region, the situation is much more complex uh, when it, on many levels, when it comes to politics, when it comes to financial capacity of the society, um, economy, and so on. So we have to take that into consideration. And I think back then you had over 3,000 um, supporters who supported you financially with 3,000 hoofs. Am I correct? Yes. 1,000. 1,000. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, it's, it's in thousands. It's that currency in, in thousands. So that was, for example, a, a good inspiration to us. So uh, in our case, um, mm, we, uh, we are a group of, I would say, more underdogs. So um, we had a couple of, and we still continue on to, to build on this. So one thing is that we really wanted to get out in the open and to have a lot of um, live interaction with people. And you also said that, offline events. So for example, when Outriders was launching, there was like a huge party organized for this. So lots of people came. And this is the moment where we initiated our crowdfunding campaign. So we started with the crowdfunding campaign. Just before the, just before the campaign for six months, we, uh, we did um, showcase stories, five or six interactive big stories, basically to show what we want to do, how we want to work. And we said, okay, this is what we did in our volunteer free time. Um, and okay, and now we need some capital basically to kickstart. But if you give that, uh, if you uh, would be willing to donate us, this will happen. And that campaign lasted for 40 days. It was the, 40, the, the worst 40 days of my life, um, but uh, it, did, it, it ended uh, with a great success, with 106 or 8 percent, um, and we, found, we managed to crowdfund 86,000 złotych, which is roughly 20-something thousand euros, more or less. And, um, and that gave us initial runway, but most importantly, that gave us 637 people which are still, uh, who are still with us. Who, um, with whom we work closely, um, who are really uh, who were really engaging in the campaign, who really were really, really engaging after the campaign, and um, our let's say initial community. And the more, the more we are, we are what 15 months after that that campaign has finished, the more I value the aspect of getting those people, the um, building relationship, building a brand, than just the financial aspect of it, um, because. Um, it has, I have, we, I, we have been to three meetings in where I talk to someone and try to pitch out riders and then someone says like, but I donated to your campaign. So we will work with you. And I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> I didn't know. So you may discover that people who support you are really in, in, in different places. So that was basically the, the initial, um, so one thing is the events. We've also had lots of, we, um, we were doing exhibitions so trying to put stories as exhibitions, um, some workshops. Uh, we have another meeting coming up at the end of April with the community. So that is one thing. The second thing is really showcasing the process of, of how we work on a story. So my colleague Rafa is here and Marcin, they work on a, a story which is, called, uh, which is called Zones of Fear, which is basically it's a, a fact checking uh, slash interactive story about where we try to, I mean, in Poland, there is a lot of narratives done by more right-wing media 
that there are parts of, I don't know, Paris, Malmo, uh, Brussels, Duisburg, which are occupied by the Sharia law and something in, in this and this narrative, so we are just fact-checking it, providing a story, and actually what is a great discovery, I think, people are really engaging within the process of it. So we announced that, for example, we are sending reporters to Malmo, this is what we plan to do, but maybe we are wrong, what is, your, what, what is the idea? People feed in into this, and this is a story which is also um, provoc, I mean, it is not provocative by our intention, it is, sim it, it, it is a topic which is, in general, generating lots of emotions, so it's getting a lot of traction, um, so, in, in, including people, so when you have a pro story process production, uh, we try to make as much of it as open and public and inclusive in different parts. So it's not only that we work in secret and then we just publish, hit the publish button and then they're ready to receive awards. Uh, you know, it's more like f from the initial idea, we try to whether, and we use simple tools, uh, you know, through it, you know, like Instagram stories, um, um, our fan page, Twitter, uh, but most importantly, I think, which, which is in our biggest, when it comes to relationship building. So after, so one thing was that pool of people who trusted us in the campaign, 637. Um, the other pool is that the magazine, which we release every Friday as, an, as a newsletter, because every week there is a direct contact with us. And the first part of it, um, there is in, 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 in the magazine, which is, uh, I think, no, they just finished it working, uh, which is, um, Grzegorz is also sitting there, who, 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 who writes the stories. Um, there's eight stories, and that's usually something between 10 to 12,000 characters. So that's a big email you get every Friday from us. Uh, but the introduction is very personal. So we have, for example, in our, let's say, relationship strategy, we have said that we will be saying um, per you, which in English is not a big deal, but in Polish language it, it is a big deal. In English I would say like, hey, how are you? In Polish I would be go like uh, pan pani, which is like, uh, hello lady, uh, but uh, you know, so uh, hello mister, which is like this, uh, there is a barrier. So if you go directly per you, it's, um, you, you, the distance is much closer, for example. So, and we were really thinking about such things. And that part in the newsletter is something where we share, like we are happy that we are in Perugia, for example. You know, we have this, this and that session, for example. Or that uh, something maybe is not working, something is working. So it's not only, you know, about how great we are, but how human we are. Uh, and that is very important to remember. So it's not only that you, we blast people with our success, uh, it's more like we, we try to be as normal as it gets. And, um, and that really works because on occasion, we ask people for help and they help. Um, whether it's, this is an important story, please can you push it forward to, 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 your, to your friends and so on. Whether it's like, we could use some money or um, I don't know, stuff like this, it works. And I think it's a combination of like being as human as possible. I know it sounds silly, but the example is that this is really sharing this. Um, being really active in offline space because uh, thousands of followers are nice, but I would always trade this for a uh, hundred people in a live meeting uh, because it's a totally different relationship. And the other thing is I think that it's in this relationship with our readers, we, we don't think we have to be liked or loved. It's more about getting some, some kind of a respect. So, because this is, I think, for us as journalists, we do stories which actually, in many cases, piss off people, you know? Because they contradict their beliefs, um, they present the facts which make them unhappy, so um, this is, we are not there for the love, just more for the respect. It's cool that if someone loves us, but uh, um, at the end of the day, it's like whether we can have a conversation, because in many, uh, many cases, we know we have, we, have, we have people who disagree with us. So this is important, I think. Okay. Um, thank, th th thanks a lot for that, uh, Kuba. Um, so uh, a, a lot of things, and I think we, we, we do hear quite a bit of overlap. So there's an element of, 
you know, having to show journalists as, as humans and sort of showing the more personal touch. Um, there's, there is an element of reaching out through electronic means and then uh, actually the conversion of getting people to fund your media uh, is almost as a, it, it's not just the financial part of the story, which of course is great, uh, but there's also almost a psych it sounds like there's a psychological element of I have supported this media so it sort of segment it, it cements that that feeling of I, I do trust them um, one topic that I wanted to touch upon a little bit is um, you know what are the what are the risks and and sort of what are uh, you know the challenges of this kind of outreach um, you know, one of the topics that has been raised in, in, in recent days, and I'm actually curious uh, to test the crowd a little bit, um, how many uh, of you, hands up, have followed the latest news with uh, The Correspondent? Okay, so relatively, relatively few. Okay, so I, I, you know, maybe just to give a, a, a brief summary, um, uh, the, the Correspondent, very successful membership-based project based out of the Netherlands, um, ha had a crowdfunding campaign that was driven by, um, you know, quite famous pr sort of prestigious ambassadors about moving to the U.S. Um, and uh, recently has been, had a bit of a challenge around um, the perception of are they actually fully opening, you know, the same kind of operations in the U.S. or is it just an expansion into the English language markets? And I think, you know, uh, sort of without deep diving into that uh, too much, I think you know what what came out of that is a certain portion of people felt disappointed when they found out that a huge crowdfunding campaign would not lead to a massive expansion into the US market but rather a just general expansion into the English language um, reporting and um, so I, I would like to ask uh, the, the panelists um, you know what are your thoughts on this, but also what are the risks that you see in terms of building these kinds of relationships that are based on, you know, this kind of almost personal trust uh, with, with readers? If we're talking about this case you mentioned, I think that uh, if I heard, if I read about this, uh, that um, now the editorial, they say that our audience didn't understand us. Mm -hmm. So it was like misunderstanding. It happens, I agree. But for me, if audience doesn't understand you, it's your mistake. Because we are media, we should find the best uh, communicators, if, uh, especially if we are talking about money, especially if we are talking about relationships with audience. So if audience, it, a lot of people uh, understood that they will open office in, uh, in the US, yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that it's their mistake, mistake yeah. of, uh, of editorial, mistake of journalists. And I think that in this case, they just should say that, sorry, guys, and open this office in the US. <laughs> In, in, in our case, uh, we had a funny s story that we did an article on a certain company which did some, something wrong or there was some, some shady story about the company. And then the head of the company and owner of the company started to call me that, oh, I'm your subscriber. How come you write something? <laughs> something? He, he paid like 1,000 for in some months, so three euros a month. But he already felt that now he should be he should should be not criticized by Atlas. So, so, but when when then we explain that this does not mean immunity, and and also the other problem is that that uh, journalists are not used to 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 put their their faces and their personal things to 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 the shop window. So some journalists are not not willing to do like fundraising. Uh, uh, speeches or sp fundraising videos and and so on and and uh, on the other hand the other problem is when when some journalists get so much involved into this self marketing that they forget they also should do some journalism work and not only self promotion so so this represents a lot of uh, ch challenges but uh, but still I, I think we made a very good decision when we decided to, 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 to campaign for, for uh, micro donations. 
Ooh, I mean, it's like a topic number one here, but uh, I mean, in Perugia. Um, so in our case, um, there is a couple of things. So one is that when you do a crowdfunding campaign or any campaign, there is some kind of a promise made and you have to deliver on that on the promise. Um, and what happened, I think, with the correspondent case it was that a different understanding from the editorial team and from the community team what, what, what that promise was. Um, so, I mean, when we finished our campaign and um, we, we just had, uh, we, we narrowed down a set of mistakes we can make, but two were a killer ones for us. One was like a big journalistic mistake as a young startup, which was like going crazy on values. And the second one was not, not deliver on the promise what we have uh, built into the campaign. And before the campaign, we have spent a lot of time trying to be really sure that what we are promising is very clearly visible and that it, that it is provided so that we can say yes or no or zero one. So we will do a story on elephants, story done or not. You know, it's just so we can later on, at some point after the campaign, we can say, okay, job done. Here is everything what we promised and it is done. So that is important to have that in mind. The other thing which we have later on discovered is that because we do, okay, so we do either campaigns or we do big interactive stories every two months, I want to say, and now my team is laughing, uh, every three months, um, two and a half months, um, <laughs> is that people notice us in, a, in those peaks. Um, so uh, whether it's, so they notice us for a very short period of time. At the same time, when they see us, there is like a lot of messaging, a lot of information, you know, it's very rapid. And there is no way we understood it, that we can actually transmit who we are, why we do it, and that the community, people who read the newsletter, they get it. You know, so it's really a fascinating process sometimes when we try to ask someone like, why do you follow us and so on. And can someone can say, because we like the graphics. And I'm like, but is it independent journalism? No, it's just the graphics. Um, so, uh, and I, try, I call this like kind of leveling with your community. So like trying to understand what others think about you because that can help you then understand like, oh, maybe we have actually screwed up our communication or there was some mistake, maybe we used some word which allowed too much imagination. Because you know, in every campaign you put some things into imagination. That's, that's how campaign works. Campaign is like a trailer to a movie, you know? And we have seen like good trailers in many cases and very bad movies after it. So we have to be very sure that the trailer is not better than your movie. Um, so just, just to finish this, so I think that that process of actually trying to understand what others think about you shows you a lot whether there is some extra communication uh, which you have to do uh, or maybe there are some things which people misunderstood about you and maybe you, can un maybe you, should, maybe you should address it this way. Yes. Yes, I would like to add uh, about uh, content we produce. Uh, as I mentioned, we uh, work with uh, big crimes. For the last two years, we published uh, two documentaries about murders. And for sure, we want, when we are talking about producing documentary, for sure, we want to ask, for sure, we want to make que que uh, question who killed this person or who killed this person, if we are talking about murders. But we have a lot of talkings, a lot of discussions in our editorial, and we understand, we know that we can't answer in our documentary, in our stories, if we can't answer to question who killed this person or who killed the other person, uh, we shouldn't uh, confuse audience. We shouldn't promise them in our stories, in our content, uh, uh, answers we didn't uh, uh, questions answers um, questions uh, we didn't find answers. We should be clear. We should be honest. If um, in these two documentaries I, I mentioned, uh, we found we figured out that police and uh, security service and prosecutors did, didn't do their work. Uh, good enough. So it was, in general, it was our findings. For sure, we wanted to tell audience from 
our documentary, you will know who killed this person. But we didn't find this, uh, this answer. So we should be honest with audience, with stuff we do, with stories we do. We should uh, set only questions we really answer in the end. It's very important for us and I think for journalism in general. Um, th thank you for that. Uh, so so it, it sounds to me like um, it, it wasn't necessarily a, a, a failing of the model. Uh, it was. It, it's just you know we are discovering various risks about um, w w what sort of can torpedo communications or, or, or what can sort of damage the relationships. But when it comes to the model of using sort of ambassadors and and you know um, driving this sort of personal connection and then scaling it. Uh, the way it was done with, with the correspondent, the model kind of works. We're just sort of no, learning. No, I would never uh, yeah. blame the model on it. Yeah. You know, that would be, I think, going too okay. fast. Okay. I mean, I understand that maybe last week, because of the position, the correspondent yeah. has, uh, D and D has uh, risen to, has created this like, uh, yeah. what is going on moment. But, I mean, at the end of the day, it's also like you may have a, a mistake happened. Yeah but uh, there is still something after the mistake. And I think yeah. this is a very important part of it. And yeah. uh, uh, it's also that there are different reasons for mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, when you show a lot of the process, um, the community may warn you about a mistake which you uh, are about to make. Yeah. Uh, even if in a fact-checking process, for example, um, um, that, that's one thing. Um, the other is uh, like we, <laughs> We've only by accident, we, I remember we've had uh, a, a little piece about New Caledonia and all of the sources were saying A and we, in, in the community we've had a person who was actually doing some work in New Caledonia which is like virtually 0.01% chance yeah. and that person told us basically that that, that, is, that is something different. But the other thing, if you build up a trust and you show your process, they understand that your mistake was not done on purpose, you didn't want to harm, and that gives you some credit. So, yeah. you know, it's like when we do something wrong, we still have something, we can still make a next move. And that move yeah. is usually deciding because we have seen great comebacks yeah. from so, uh, and bigger failures. Um, I, I, I think that's a great point. And, and, you know, we are still very much in a learning phase of sort of rediscovering how, how media should work. Um, I'd like to open the discussion. If there are any questions from the audience, uh, I have a couple of my own, but I do want to give other people a chance to talk. OK, great. Uh, I'm actually very happy because I, I really do want to um, ask one. Uh, so it, it, it's it's starting like we're, we're starting to see the fuzzy contours of a of an answer here, and we do see that the personal touch is important, the human face of the journalists, uh, which uh, you know is 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 becomes a bit of a, a human orchestra, fundraising, being a celebrity, and everything seems very tiring. But but we see that that is important. We see that the multi-pronged approach of using you know multi-layered electronic, but also offline communications is is critical. Um, this sounds like an answer. How is it scalable? Because it feels like a lot of legwork. Right, and it feels like something that's very tiring. You know, how can this be accelerated? Sorry for the light question. <laughs> Go ahead. Basically, as I, I told you, this in Hungary, this happened that that this mm -hmm. so small scale uh, support uh, campaigns turned were adopted by larger media organizations like Index or Havegate, so real big big newsrooms adopted this model and they were able to raise a significant uh, amount of money. So it, it seems that it, it does work, but maybe it requires a hostile political environment when people really <laughs> care about uh, uh, the, the remaining free media outlets. Uh, so, so, okay, so that's, that's slightly uh, pessimistic, but I do see the point. You, you essentially use the state pressure as a, as a trampoline. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, Kupi, uh, Kuba, you look like you have some thoughts. Too many, actually. Okay. Uh, no, I mean, I don't know, to be honest. That, that would mm -hmm. be my answer. I mean, uh, this is something what we are strangling. This is something what we want to do personally because yeah. of the problems we want to solve because of the mission we have settled uh, yeah. as an organization. And I 
of course, dream about it that it's going to be successful. Um, whether it's going to be like this or not, I don't know. I mean, we, we see uh, also that, you know, a lot of big mainstream media, I mean, is really looking at us yeah. and they're really adopting the model. I mean, there was two or three other crowdfunding campaigns mm -hmm. also done b after us. So, you know, we are a very small organization. I, whenever I like, say in the session, I try to like pretend that everything is strategized in our organization and we have processes for everything. Well, we have, uh, we have, no, it's basically one big chaos. Uh, just, you know, sometimes it's calmer chaos and sometimes it's just a storm, basically, you know, because we are, we are flexible, we have to try new things, we move fast, uh, we, we don't break things, but uh, we move, uh, we move okay. fast and uh, so far it's, we are happy from where we are, but uh, we still have a huge road ahead in steps yeah. of like convincing people to stay on us. In our case, we have chosen to be non-partisan, yeah. which if we were partisan, we would probably be already on break even, strictly financially speaking, uh, that we have chosen to say good words about journalism, so, and be very positive towards journalism and show yeah. its importance, because it's very easy to say like mainstream media suck and also run on this as an enemy. Um, so we have done everything we could to limit our chances, uh, frankly speaking. Um, but uh, it's because uh, we are trying to attract both sides uh, of our polarized uh, and partisan society and uh, mm -hmm. build on something which can create a debate. And whether it is achievable, we will see in probably two, three years. I hope it is. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, w w one more, in, unless anyone else wants to ask, because I, I still have a few. Um, so, so maybe, maybe Anya, if, if sort of we, we're not yet clear on, you know, what is the accelerant, what is the way to, to scale this, this model massively, what do you think is the balance that journalists should have between being journalists and, uh, I, I won't call it public relations, I'll call it community relations, um, to maybe make the, it a little bit less charged? Oh, I think, I, unfortunately, I don't have answer and I don't think that uh, anyone has answer because it's in every case, it's uh, different. It depends on a lot of things. But now we know after bad things happened with Slitstvo, with media in Ukraine, that we um, have to defend our work. We have to talk about work publicly, not only published product. We have to defend, we have to talk with audience and as much as it possible. I mean, it's never enough to explain, it's never enough to have uh, contact, to connect with audience. So, I mean, it's not like uh, uh, like model we can use. We should uh, look for better and better and better and better. In, in that case, let, let me just uh, summarize a little bit because I think we have, we have uncovered uh, some of the questions. So if we look back to what we were aiming for, no, I can't do it here. Anyway, we, we, we were looking for a solution that is realistic, replicatable, and scalable. I think we have one that is realistic and one that can be replicated. Uh, the question of scalability is still something that evades us. Um, uh, now, just a little bit of... Um, Shameless plugging, sorry. Um, uh, we, we do intend to, to continue this discussion, so for those who have an opportunity, um, uh, you, you will get to see the, the, the same people and, and, and a few others at Mezhikiria Fest in, in Kiev. Um, the idea is that now we will uh, basically test these models and sort of try to develop learnings and, so, and best practices that can be actually shared with people to accelerate this process and hopefully look for that myth mythical beast of a, you know, of a realistic working model that can be scaled easily um, to, to larger organizations. Um, 